When I was a kid, my family lived in a small town nestled deep within a sprawling forest. Our house was the last one on a dead-end road, with nothing but trees for miles behind it. The isolation was eerie, but as a child, I didn't think much of it. It was just home. One summer, when I was about ten years old, something happened that still haunts me to this day. It started innocently enough, as most terrifying stories do. It was a hot, humid afternoon, and my best friend, Jake, and I were bored out of our minds. We decided to explore the woods behind my house, a place our parents had always warned us to stay away from. Don't go too far, they'd say. The woods can be dangerous. But we were kids, and we craved adventure. So, armed with a couple of flashlights and a pocket knife, we ventured into the dense forest. The first hour or so was uneventful. We climbed trees, jumped over streams, and made up stories about hidden treasures and secret hideouts. The deeper we went, the thicker the canopy became, blocking out the sun and casting everything in a dim, greenish light. That's when we stumbled upon it. A clearing in the woods, perfectly circular, with a large, old oak tree standing right in the center. The tree was unlike any I'd ever seen before. Its bark was almost black, and its twisted branches reached out like gnarled fingers. There was something about it that made my skin crawl. Cool, Jake said, running up to the tree. Check this out. He pointed to a carving in the bark. It was a symbol, an intricate design of loops and lines that didn't make any sense. Beneath the symbol, there were words etched deeply into the wood. They were faded, but still legible, beware the shadow in the woods. It sees you. Jake laughed it off, but I felt a chill run down my spine. The air around us seemed to grow colder, and the forest, which had been alive with the sounds of birds and insects, fell eerily silent. Maybe we should go back, I suggested, suddenly feeling very small and very scared. Don't be a chicken, Jake scoffed. It's just some old carving. Come on, let's keep exploring. Reluctantly, I followed him deeper into the woods. The deeper we went, the darker and more oppressive the forest became. I kept glancing over my shoulder, feeling like we were being watched. Then we heard it. A low, rumbling growl that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. We froze, our flashlights flickering as we scanned the darkness for the source of the sound. Did you hear that? Jake whispered, his bravado slipping away. Yeah, I replied, my voice barely audible. Maybe we should go back now. Before he could respond, something moved in the shadows. A tall, dark figure, almost human but not quite, stepped out from behind a tree. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow, and its mouth twisted into a grotesque smile. We bolted. Running faster than we ever had before, we tore through the woods, branches scratching at our faces and legs. The creature gave chase, its footsteps thundering behind us. I could hear its growls, closer and closer. Somehow, we made it back to the clearing with the old oak tree. The creature stopped at the edge, hissing and retreating into the darkness as if the tree was protecting us. Breathless and terrified, we collapsed under the tree, holding each other as we tried to make sense of what had just happened. What was that thing? Jake asked, his voice trembling. I don't know, I replied, my heart pounding in my chest. But we need to get out of here. We scrambled to our feet and ran back towards my house, not daring to look back. When we finally burst through the tree line and into my backyard, we collapsed on the grass, gasping for air. We never told our parents what happened that day. We didn't think they'd believe us. But we knew what we saw and we knew to stay away from the woods. Years passed, and we grew older. Jake moved away, and I went to college, trying to forget about the creature in the woods. But the memory never really left me. It lingered in the back of my mind, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurked just beyond the edge of the trees. Then, last summer, I returned to my hometown to visit my parents. I was sitting on the porch one evening, looking out at the woods, when I saw it. A pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back at me from the tree line. 
I felt that same cold chill I'd felt as a kid, the same sense of dread. I knew then that the creature was still out there, watching and waiting. I don't go into the woods anymore. I stay close to the house, where it feels safe. But sometimes, late at night, I hear it. The low, rumbling growl echoing through the trees. A reminder that the shadow in the woods is always there, always watching. So, if you ever find yourself near a forest, heed this warning, beware the shadow in the woods. It sees you. And it never forgets. I grew up in a small rural town, the kind where everyone knows each other's business and secrets rarely stay hidden for long. But there was one secret that remained shrouded in mystery, whispered about only in hushed tones and fearful glances. It was the tale of the whispering well. The well stood on the outskirts of town, in a field that had long been abandoned. Overgrown with weeds and surrounded by a rusting iron fence, it was a place that both intrigued and terrified the local children. Our parents warned us never to go near it, claiming it was dangerous, but they never gave us a real reason why. Naturally, this only fueled our curiosity. One summer evening, when I was about twelve, my friends and I decided to investigate the well. There were five of us, me, my best friend Sam, twins Lucy and Lisa, and Danny, the bravest of the bunch. We waited until twilight, when the shadows stretched long and the town settled into the quiet of night. We crept through the tall grass, our flashlights casting long beams of light in the growing darkness. The air was thick with the scent of earth and the sound of crickets. As we approached the well, an uneasy silence fell over us. The well was old, made of weathered stone, with a rotting wooden roof and a frayed rope dangling into the darkness below. It looked ancient, as if it had been there since the beginning of time. I felt a shiver run down my spine as we gathered around it. Do you think the stories are true? Lucy asked, her voice trembling. Only one way to find out, Danny replied, stepping closer to the edge. He picked up a pebble and dropped it into the well. We listened, straining to hear the sound of it hitting the water, but there was nothing. Just an endless, echoing silence. Hello. Sam called out, leaning over the edge. Is anyone there? For a moment, there was only silence. Then, faint and barely audible, we heard it, a whisper. It was a soft, sibilant sound, like someone speaking just out of earshot. We exchanged nervous glances. Did you hear that? Lisa whispered, clutching her sister's arm. Yeah, I said, my heart pounding in my chest. Maybe we should go. But Danny, always the daring one, shook his head. No way, we came this far. Let's see what it says. He leaned over the well again, his ear close to the opening. The rest of us held our breath, waiting. The whispering grew louder, more distinct, but still unintelligible. Danny's eyes widened, and he suddenly pulled back, his face pale. What is it? Sam asked, fear creeping into his voice. Danny shook his head, his mouth opening and closing like a fish out of water. Finally, he found his voice. It said my name. It knows my name. A chill settled over us. We backed away from the well, our bravado vanishing. Just as we were about to turn and run, we heard it again. This time, it was louder, clearer, a chorus of voices, whispering our names. Panic set in, and we bolted, racing back through the field towards the safety of town. As we ran, the whispers followed us, growing louder and more insistent. It felt like we were being chased by the voices, like they were reaching out to us from the depths of the well. We didn't stop running until we were back in the town square, panting and drenched in sweat. The whispers had faded, but the terror lingered. None of us spoke about what had happened, too afraid to put it into words. We just went home, each of us haunted by the experience. That night, I had the worst nightmares of my life. I dreamed of the well, of the voices calling my name, of cold, ghostly hands reaching up from the darkness to drag me down. I woke up screaming, my heart racing, and it took me hours to calm down. I've always been fascinated by ghost stories, but I never believed in them. 
That changed the year I spent summer break at my uncle's house. He owned a sprawling, dilapidated mansion known as Harper House, situated on the outskirts of a small New England town. The house had a long, dark history, and the townsfolk whispered about it with a mix of fear and reverence. My uncle, a jovial man in his fifties, had inherited Harper House from a distant relative. He never stayed there, preferring his cozy cottage in town, but he allowed me to stay there that summer when I needed a quiet place to work on my thesis. Just be careful, he said with a wink as he handed me the keys. The place has a mind of its own. I laughed it off, thinking he was trying to spook me. I drove up the winding road to Harper House, eager to settle in. The house loomed over the landscape, its Victorian architecture casting long, eerie shadows in the fading light. As I approached, I noticed the windows seemed to watch me, like eyes peering into my soul. Inside, the house was musty and dim, filled with antique furniture and dusty portraits of stern-faced ancestors. I spent the first few days cleaning and setting up my workspace in the library, which quickly became my favorite room with its floor-to-ceiling bookshelves and large, ornate fireplace. The first night, I heard the whispers. It was subtle at first, like the rustling of leaves in the wind. I dismissed it as my imagination and focused on my writing. But as the days passed, the whispers grew louder, more distinct. They seemed to follow me from room to room, always just out of earshot, always just on the edge of my awareness. One night, while working late in the library, I felt a chill. The fire had died down, and the room was plunged into darkness. I stood to relight it, but as I did, I felt a presence behind me. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I turned slowly, expecting to see someone standing there. There was no one, but the air was thick with an oppressive energy. I hurried to light the fire, the flickering flames casting dancing shadows on the walls. That's when I saw it, a figure, just for a moment, reflected in the glass of the bookcase. It was a woman, dressed in a tattered old gown, her face pale and eyes hollow. I spun around, but the room was empty. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to rationalize what I'd seen. It must have been a trick of the light, I told myself, and returned to my work, though sleep eluded me that night. The next morning, I explored the house, hoping to find some logical explanation. In the attic, I discovered a dusty old trunk filled with yellowed letters and faded photographs. They belonged to Elizabeth Harper, the original owner of the house. According to the letters, she had died under mysterious circumstances, and her spirit was rumored to haunt the halls. The more I read, the more I felt her presence. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, and I began to hear my name being called in the dead of night. It was Elizabeth, I was sure of it, and she was trying to tell me something. One particularly stormy night, the whispers led me to the basement. The door creaked open on rusty hinges, revealing a dark, damp space filled with old furniture and cobwebs. As I descended the stairs, the temperature dropped, and I could see my breath in the air. The whispers guided me to a corner of the basement, where I found a loose stone in the wall. Behind it was a small, hidden compartment containing a journal. It was Elizabeth's diary, detailing her descent into madness. She wrote about hearing voices, seeing shadows, and feeling an evil presence lurking in the house. Her final entry chilled me to the bone, the house is alive. It feeds on our fear. It won't let me leave. I dropped the diary and fled upstairs, but the house seemed to come alive around me. Doors slammed, windows rattled, and the whispers turned into agonized screams. I felt trapped, suffocated by the house's malevolent energy. In a panic, I grabbed my keys and ran to my car, not stopping until I reached my uncle's cottage. He listened calmly as I recounted my experience, nodding slowly. I tried to warn you, he said. Harper House is cursed. It's been that way for generations. We returned the next day to retrieve my belongings, but I never set foot in Harper House again. My uncle eventually sold it, but I hear the new owners didn't stay long. The house remains vacant, a dark blot on the landscape, its secrets hidden within its walls. I still have nightmares about Harper House. I can still hear the whispers, 
feel the chill of the basement, and see Elizabeth's hollow eyes staring at me from the shadows. Some places are cursed, their dark histories seeping into the very walls, and Harper House is one of them. If you ever find yourself near that old mansion on the hill, do yourself a favor and stay away. Because once it has you in its grasp, it never lets go.